Principles of External Fixation. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Ritesh Khokar, and I am Sankib Rahman narrating. And in this uh, third and final video from the slide deck, uh, we're going to pick up uh, and talk about uh, hexapod frames. We've already done uh, quite a bit of basic principles of uh, external fixation, monolateral fixators. We started to talk about ring fixators. So a hexapod frame, uh, an example of this is the Taylor spatial frame. I'll just kind of jump ahead and then come back just so you see what we're talking about. So something that looks like this. So this allows for simultaneous correction in six axes, coronal angulation and translation, sagittal angulation and translation, and rotation and length. And it can use a web-based software interfacing with digital x-rays in order to help understand um, what needs to be done with each, um, with each uh, telescoping rod uh, in order to achieve the alignment you're looking for. And it allows the rings themselves to be positioned in any orientation uh, within their respective limb segment. And then it can sort of, within the degrees of freedom that each telescoping rod allow, then it, it can then um, use uh, any reasonable starting point and then achieve the correction. So uh, you have to use transfiction wires or a minimum of three half pins on either side of the fracture. You have, um, you, you'll have something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, these can be stiff, uh, I'm sorry, these can be useful for stiff hypertrophic non-unions, infection, bone loss, limb length discrepancy, or if you have a fracture that perhaps you might need to otherwise fix acutely with uh, plates and screws, but they have a very poor soft tissue envelope, you could consider this. So um, the Taylor spatial frame uh, can certainly achieve um, uh, reduction uh, of acute deformation. So if you have a type 3 open tibia fracture, for example, uh, this can help you to get reduction and help to close soft tissue defects. So let's say you had a wound over here and you wanted to sort of let that soft tissue approximate and come together. You can see with acute deformity, um, you're actually creating a deformity to get the wound to close and then you can slowly bring it back to the original position. So this is a way you can actually use an external fixator to assist with wound closure or wound management if it's not appropriate, for instance, for free tissue transfer. So here's an example of that uh, intentional deformation. So you have a large open wound. You actually uh, allow the soft tissue to come together by deforming the limb uh, and then gradually bringing back to the original position and um, with a wound closed, you now have a much more stable soft tissue envelope. So um, you can also use a, a, a locking plate as an internal external fixator or as an external external fixator. So this is a sort of unusual um, way, but uh, this, this has been described uh, where you actually place the plate outside the soft tissue envelope following closed reduction. And uh, as we know, this... Uh, you know, provides fixation. Now, this is, if you're going to put it externally, you probably can just use an external fixator device, uh, but just an example of uh, something else that can be done and perhaps can be more stable. Um, so what about MRI compatibility? This comes up all the time. There's safety concerns uh, about ferromagnetism. Uh, there can be an issue of heating of the metallic implant and biologic tissues, uh, of course, it can also cause image distortion. So just from a diagnostic uh, standpoint, MRI with uh, pins and external fixators on can make imaging uh, potentially difficult. Uh, a lot of MRI devices now are safe as long as the components are not directly within the scanner. Um, and um, there are MRI components that are designated as MRI safe uh, that um, uh, will... And if you use titanium pens, I think this is a, uh, a setup for um, a, a frame that should be able to be safely imaged. And there's a reference here for you. So different modes of fixation. So you can use an external fixer in compression. If you have good bone stock and you have good, uh, you can get the bone ends to connect and contact. Uh, this is used to complete union of a fracture, for instance, or arthrodesis. 
Uh, it can be used for neutralizing if you have comminution and bone loss and you don't want to use a bridge pleating, uh, for example, um, or, uh, relative or similar device, you can use this. Uh, what about distraction? We've already showed examples of that. So fixators can be used in distraction mode. And if you do it according to distraction osteogenesis principles, uh, you can actually generate bone while you distract. An external fixation indeed helps to facilitate external bridging callus. It's highly dependent on the integrity of the soft tissue envelope. Um, you are able to, with the appropriate uh, distraction osteogenesis technique, bridge very large gaps and actually deal with bone loss by using this technique. So what is that? Well, there's mechanical induction of new bone that can occur between bony surfaces that are gradually pulled apart. And this so-called tension stress effect uh, where you get distraction osteogenesis um, that uh, takes place by formation of a physis-like structure in that gap. Uh, and you have this interzone uh, from which new bone forms in parallel columns extending in both direction uh, and cells are recruited from the periosteum. So here's an example where you can see ring fixator. Uh, this is probably a transport segment here. Uh, or perhaps there's just been straight up distraction and here you can see all the new regenerate bone formed by distraction osteogenesis and it's going to microscopically look like this on the right. So uh, how you do this is um, very technique dependent so the rate and rhythm of distraction are crucial. Um, so depending on which bone uh, you're talking about and uh, you know it's an adult versus child um, it's going to vary and uh, the distraction rate usually is about 0.5 to 2 millimeters per day so uh, Ilazar recommended one millimeter so for the adult tibia for example one millimeter of distraction into four divided doses in 24 hours so you basically would go a quarter millimeter per uh, turn uh, of the device uh, four times a day to get one millimeter a day uh, and then a constant distraction over a 24-hour period you can then go a millimeter a day, in 10 days you've gone a centimeter, and so forth. So the tissues respond to this slow application of prolonged tension with metaplasia and will differentiate into the corresponding tissue type. So bone responds first, followed by muscle, ligament, tendons, and neurovascular structures. So shifting gears, what about damage control external fixation? Well, these are patients where you have to focus on the initial resuscitation uh, and other injuries. Uh, this is also done to minimize the so-called second physiologic hit to avoid multiple organ failure and sort of a SERS phenomenon from early intramedullary nailing in a patient who is so-called borderline and primed uh, for that phenomenon to occur with a definitive fixation. So they, you wait that period out with an external fixator. And the aims are to rapidly stabilize long bones and pelvis fractures to maintain length alignment rotation and provide initial stabilization in a slightly different form of periarticular fracture. So this is not sort of the classic damage control, but this is another thing we use uh, when the soft tissues are not appropriate for internal fixation, but we do need to get fractures out to length. Uh, so a joint spanning temporary fixator can help with that. So with those complex fractures, ligamentotaxis helps to um, get the fractures grossly reduced. Uh, and over time, this can help uh, reduce injury-related swelling and edema. Uh, and um, there is a risk of fixator creep or gradual loosening of fixator components over time. So you do have to sort of check periodic x-rays. And if you are not ready for fixation but have lost reduction, you may need to consider a frame adjustment. Um, so uh, here is an example of a damage control external fixator, uh, and you can see there's a substantial fracture blistering. Um, external fixators can also be placed uh, percutaneously for pelvic fixation. Here's an example used in unstable pelvic ring injuries uh, where you have uh, an external fixator um, to, to stabilize the anterior ring. Uh, to do this, there's a video if you go to otaonline.org and you can kind of see the technique for uh, for doing this uh, external fixator. What about conversion to internal fixation? Well, 
Definitive, early definitive stabilization minimizes complications, generally safe within two to three weeks. Um, staged conversion can be done if the pin sites are infected. Uh, you have to remove the fixer to debride the pin sites, put the patient in a splint or traction and antibiotics, and then do definitive fixation once the infection settles. Complications include pin loosening, pin tract infection. Uh, these unfortunately are the most common complications. Of course, you want to avoid neurovascular injury and impaling important soft tissues like tendon units, um, malunion, nonunion, um, compartment syndrome. So pin loosening and infection is multifactorial, but it can start with thermal and mechanical damage of the bone during pin insertion, uh, excessive pin site tissue motion, so sort of relaxing incisions, and um, sometimes you can't control it if you have a pin uh, if, if the bone is very, very deep to the, uh, compared to the skin, so, you know, the proximal thigh or in the areas like that, you can't control the amount of tissue that's there. Um, whereas in the, um, areas like the anteromedial tibia, there's very little tissue. So you're less likely to have those problems. And these pin tract infections can be graded as shown here. So that's what you want to avoid, um, is a pin tract infection like that. These can become chronic um, here you can see some examples of that with ring sequestrum, uh, and uh, that can be chronic osteomyelitis. If not treated, uh, it can really be an ongoing problem. So external fixation, in summary, it's a minimally invasive and flexible tool. It can be applied quickly. can be used for temporary as well as definitive stabilization. Uh, the appropriate frame type uh, should be used per clinical indication, uh, and you can get a good, very good outcome. Uh, early recognition and treatment of complications is vital. Here are the references. Thank you very much.